Hi, this is Claudia Phylos with the Center for Hellenic Studies. I'm here today with Justin Arft of the University of Missouri and Epimia Karakanza of the University of Patras in Greece. And we're also joined by several um, really cherished community members uh, who are members of the Heroes X community and the Hour 25 community. So um, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Um, so Justin, Today we're following up on a conversation we had last week, uh, which was so fruitful and so exciting that actually we, we invited you to come back to continue the conversation as soon as possible. Uh, and so we really appreciate you and Effie taking the time today to join us again uh, to continue the conversation. So can you just, can you remind us about the kind of topics that we were discussing last week so that we can pick things up from where we were? Yeah, you bet. Um... Last week, uh, Effie and I um, were speaking about divine plans in the Iliad and the Odyssey, and, and I think we, we both came to a conclusion that the, the, the poet really has control um, over the narrative, but also um, allows characters to tease us a little bit about um, the outcome of either epic, and, and um, even, even divine plans are challenged. Um, by characters or by the poet. So, um, in my presentation, we um, I, I have adopted um, this strategy of reading the Odyssey uh, in terms of divine plan. Um, this what I'm calling a poetics of suspense and delay, and and it's um, it's not a it's not a shockingly new observation in in Homeric poetics, but its application to some some more difficult problems in the epic I think is is fruitful. So. Um, I'll go ahead and just bring up a couple slides from the presentation last week to to um, to show us where where we were. Um, I'm going to go full screen here. You should be able to to see the screen now. Um, and um, we were speaking about the the Odyssey's plan. Um, in terms of, uh, and I'll just move through this really quickly because it's all available um, um, through last week's recording. But um, the, as a traditional tale, the Odyssey has a fairly um, predictable end point, um, namely that the the hero makes it home, the hero gets a homecoming. Um, but as we see um, on Ithaca, when Odysseus gets home. All sorts of suspense happens. There are delay tactics. Odysseus's identity is not revealed um, in a very straightforward manner, and it, it keeps getting deferred. So um, it's kind of part of the paradigm already in the Ithacan sequence for these kinds of things to happen. And if you read the if you read the events in the Phaeacian episode in a similar way, they are equally suspenseful, delayed, and and there are elements of danger there as well. Um, and homecoming and recognition become enmeshed. I think that's a really important point to consider is that the, the stepping on the shore is not the end of the homecoming. Um, recognition and reintegration to the household have to happen. And we left off very, very specifically trying to speak about, um, let's see, I'm, okay, here we go. Um, um, this, there's this prophecy that Alkenoos has uttered about the Phaeacians. Um, and it involves a ship. It involves the very fate of defiations, and and we appropriately uh, left on a cliffhanger last week. Uh, and it, it just worked. It, it couldn't have worked out better because I think that, uh, in in a similar way that that we and myself included are left wondering what happens to the defiations, the poet the, the poet does that to us, and we get a hint of that um, in Odyssey eight. And this is right before, um, or I'm sorry, right after Alkenoos asks for Odysseus's name. Um, which we know to be um, a very charged moment, and Odysseus's name is associated with all kinds of um, promise and hope and pain and danger. His name is a almost, I think Carolyn Higby calls, calls it a talisman um, that members of his family avoid. Um, it's, a very, it's a powerful object, so to speak, in the epic. Um, so this is just after Alkenoos asks him specifically for his name, and Odysseus says, yet this I have heard, uh, or I'm sorry, the narrator, no, Akenoa says, yes, <laughs> yet, this is, yet this I have heard once on a time from my father Nasithous, who said it and told me how Poseidon would yet be angry with us because we are convoy without hurt to all men. Uh, he said that one day, as a well-made ship of Phaeacian men came back from a convoy on the misty face of the water, he would stun it and pile a great mountain over, the, over our city to hide it 
So the old man spoke, and the god might either bring it to pass or might be left undone as the god's heart pleases. Um, so before we ever learn about this mountain and whether it's piled over the city um, in book 13, and when we learn what the Poseidon does actually strike the ship and turn it to stone, um, before this event ever happens, we are we are told that it may or may not happen. And, and as I mentioned last week, this is um, Professor Naj has done some really excellent work on this this exact passage, and he points to this moment as he calls it a loophole, um, where the poet might be given an option on how the story could unfold or not. Um, because even if Odysseus's fate is fairly determined in the epic, um, maybe the fate of the Phaeacians is not. And, and that informs also questions we should ask about Odysseus's own return. Yeah, actually, I just want to let people know that on the Hour 25 website, we actually have two things that might be interesting to people who are interested in this. Uh, we have sort of a bootleg tape of Professor Naj giving a talk about this passage, about the Phaeacians and the future of the Phaeacians, and there's also basically his written notes for that talk. So people yeah. may want to check that out on the Hour 25 website. But thank you, Justin. Please continue. Yeah, you bet. And I and I've drawn heavily on that research and that talk um, for for my own for my own thoughts on this. And um, and I think an angle that I can provide um, uh, there there are two things I can maybe add to this conversation. And and, and I really want to leave it up to everyone here to to help me sort this out because it's very complicated. <laughs> um, uh, one issue is is Queen Arete, which we which we have learned um, pri prior to this. We have learned that Arete is she's been announced that she's going to play uh, a central role in Odysseus' homecoming, once by Nausicaa and mm -hmm. once by Athena. Um, so all eyes are on the queen. Uh, Odysseus reaches the queen. He supplicates her directly. Uh, she asks, she, she then, at a very um, appropriate, actually, according to the paradigms of Xenia, she asks him his identity after he's eaten his meal. Um, and then she asks him specifically about these clothes that he had acquired from her daughter. Um, it's a very pointed question. Odysseus gives a somewhat satisfactory answer to the question, and then she kind of fades into the background of the narrative. And then we have some of the more famous scenes um, that happen within the Phaeacian court at the hands of Alcanemos. We, there's, there's, there's song and dance and contests and games. It, it, it feels very almost Iliadic. Um, and then there's this moment where Odysseus... Um, he reveals his name in book nine, and then he goes. He tells his backstory from books nine to twelve, sometimes called the apologue. And as he is telling this tale, he ends up in the underworld, obviously, and he meets his mother. And then he tells this catalog of heroines, um, and it's these famous women. And when you look more closely at the women, that they're they're often the, at the center of uh, troubled households, or they have. They have a history of maybe challenging relations with divinities. Um, and we've already learned that Arete and Alkenoas have a heritage through Poseidon. Um, right before Odysseus, right as he's coming to the end of the catalog, he, he uh, kind of abruptly stops and says, I can't go on with this story anymore. Um, I, think, I think I better just go to bed. Um, and it ends with, with this formula um, that... that refers to the audience being stricken to silence or they you know they became silent without words and when that formula happens in Homeric poetry it, it often serves as the signal that some kind of proposition that has just been made um, cannot or should not go on um, at least without modification and usually the first person to intervene or to, to interrupt the silence is speaks with some kind of authority and so in this moment um, Odysseus is leaving the Phaeacians hanging he's suspended his story it's delayed and it is Queen Arete who breaks the silence and declares that Odysseus is her, her Xenos, her guest. Um, and this is very near the, the exact center of the epic. And, and we know that one of the trajectories and streams of the Odyssey is to establish Odysseus as a, as a man of Xenia. And after all, he's going home to, to set things straight in his household. And, and there's... Um, all sorts of negative paradigms um, of, or paradigms of negative hospitality happening at home. So to me, this is a really central moment in the epic, and I think Arete does play an important role in, in kind of verifying his identity and sending him on his way. Um, 
if not directly, at least by the paradigms you would expect in a in in Homeric language. So. Um, we move on. Odys Everyone says, oh, "Well, no, of course, don't stop your story." And, and then this is when we hear about his 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 jaunt through the underworld, meeting famous heroes of the past like uh, Achilles and Heracles. Um, and there's all sorts of things we could say about that, but um, things are not things are not so glorious down there. Um, and again, Odysseus needs to get home. Um, and then as the story kind of rolls on and on, and by the time we hit book thirteen. Uh, Odysseus is is on his way home, and this is this is against the wishes of Poseidon, as we learn about in Book Five. Again, speaking of divine plan, um, Zeus has changed the plan. Zeus and Athena have changed the plan in Book Five, and when Poseidon comes back after an absence, he's pretty steamed that Odysseus is is being conveyed by the Phaeacians. And there's any number of reasons for this. Number one, he he's pretty he's pretty upset with Odysseus in the first place um, in the story, but also um, it's the Phaeacians, it's his own people who are using his, uh, for lack of a better term, magical ships to give this hero conveyance home. And if homecoming is going to define his heroism, they are, in a, they are in essence affecting his, his heroism. And I think this might be part of the reason that Poseidon is, is upset. But in any case, um, he asks Zeus what he should do. He says he wants to, he uses that same diction from the prophecy, I'd like to cover, cover them with a mountain. Um, and, and strike their ship, and Zeus says, go ahead, um, do, do what you like. And then Poseidon, in an uncharacteristic moment, perhaps, at least compared to the Iliad, says, well, I would like to annihilate them. I would like to cover their city with a mountain, but what, what do you think? And Zeus says, well, go ahead and turn their ship into stone. And, and again, this is something that Professor Naj has dealt with um, in, in great detail, as have other scholars. Um, there's a variant in the manuscript tradition that can be read either way, either in option A you see here, cover their city with a big mountain, or in a, in a, this is a great example of how um, a very small uh, variation can make a big difference in, in the outcome of a poem or the, or the meaning of, a, of an episode. Um, the option is do not cover their city with a big mountain. And, and, and this is something, this is right where I would like to begin the discussion is what are the ramifications of this? Um, um, and Poseidon does, in fact, lithify the ship, and then he disappears. And we're all left wondering, the Phaeacians especially are left wondering, is this prophecy going to be fulfilled? Um, and, and the episode, the whole Phaeacian episode even ends right in the middle of the line, uh, with the Phaeacians standing at the altar and Odysseus awaking from sleep. And one point I'd like to add that I didn't get to last time is that the Phaeacian episode begins with sleep as well, and I think that's kind of an interesting element. Um, he, Odysseus buries himself in leaves and he goes to sleep, and then here the episode ends uh, um, with him waking from his sleep, kind of almost presenting the Phaeacian episode in a dreamlike way. Um, so this is where we left off. Con questions concerning the route or the path to the outcome are raised throughout the epic. And even though we know Odysseus will arrive home, we do not know if the Phaeacians are destroyed in part or in full. Um, and especially, and this is the question I would like to raise, um, is who, who will be left to recount their story once, once Odysseus arrives back home? Um, and I think that... Um, the the exemplar of I'm, I'm getting trying to get off. See, can you all see me now? Okay, great. Um, I think the exemplar of the Achaean walls destruction is something we can think about as well. In Book Seven of the Iliad, um, Nestor proposes the the building of this wall, um, um, literally on top mm -hmm. of the tombs, uh, the Sema, the signs of heroic glory, um, and as Poseidon catches wind of this and is very upset um, in a similar way um, to his being upset about learning learning when Odysseus is being conveyed by the Phaeacians. He, all, he goes to Zeus and says, this is an affront to my honor. This is an affront to my glory. These humans are building this wall that, that will serve as a memory and a memorial of their achievements, and uh, I'm, I, I do that. <laughs> they don't do that. Zeus, I'd like to destroy this wall. And Zeus, Zeus and the gods comply. They say, yeah, we've, we have to eliminate this. This is pro a problem. And the battle goes on, and in Book 12, we get this amazing um, time kind of stops in the epic at the beginning of Book 12. 
and we it, and we're, we go to the future <laughs> where the Achaean wall is actually destroyed by the gods and Zeus rains down a flood from the heavens and things get very quiet. We're left with this image of the Achaean wall uh, in Sham or just literally an image of sand on the seashore and it's it, it's not quite a Homeric simile but it, it functions in a similar way. We, we're imagining this this natural scene and then we are immediately thrown back into the den of battle. And even in the next few lines after that, there's, there's all these words for big booming sounds. Mm -hmm. um, I think this would make a great performance moment <laughs> in any case. But um, it's, to me, it's not unsimilar to the moment when Odysseus is, a, is bracingly woken from sleep and he's back home in Ithaca and very confused as to, as, as to where he might be. He doesn't even know he's back at Ithaca. So we have all these interesting parallels between um, Poseidon's anger about honor and glory um, in both episodes. Um, and in the Achaean Wall's case, the, the wall is destroyed because it, it is a, it's a threat to the kind of honor that can be created by the gods. And I think that metapoetically, we also have to consider the kind of honor that the poet can create as well. Um, Andrew Ford writes writes on this specifically with the Achaean Wall and suggests that the wall is is kind of an em emblem for the Homeric poem, maybe even the Homeric text itself, and it demonstrates kind of a vulnerability to a tale being told. Is that um, you can render this massive edifice only for it to be destroyed, raising questions as to who is actually in control of not just the plan of the poem, but the power of memorialization. So I try to look at the Phaeacian episode and, the, and the, the threatened destruction of the Phaeacians, and specifically Zeus targeting this ship, this, this emblem of heroic um, conferring ability. Um, and I think that when you consider them in parallel, some, some interesting thoughts come about, and I think it raises new questions as to how we might interpret the, the destruction of the Phaeacians. Um, so that's... That's where we left off, and that's an added thought to bring to the discussion. But I'm, I'm, I'm curious what everyone else thinks about um, how we might read this, this, this threat or this, this loophole, um, and and is it really a matter of po poetic mem memorialization, or is, is Poseidon just rightfully angry, and should we just expect that these people are destroyed? Wow. Okay. So that is so beautiful. Um, so what do our community members think here? How, how can we engage with these questions, these beautiful questions that Justin is posing for us? Um, that's, oh, I think I might, am I frozen? This is Jackie. Nope. We hear you, Jackie. Thank you so oh. much. Oh, and thank you for introducing yourself and say where oh. you're from. <laughs> Jackie, Jackie Donlin from, uh, from Boston, Mass. well, from New York. <laughs> Unlike Janet, I'm from New York, now in Boston. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, I, I guess I had a question, uh, Justin, about what, and, and, and sorry, but I missed, I'm so upset, but I did miss your last uh, talk, uh, of what you mean by the, the plan of the poet or the will, because um, I'm thinking about when you mentioned Professor Naj's uh, talk about the Phaeacians, I, I thought that he was talking about that it was in examples of the dynamic reading of these texts that there's actually a choice and then the poet can, the poet or any, at any time can adjust his performance and choose a variant. So is that something, when I hear the word plan, I hear, you know, like board members and outlines and PowerPoint, <laughs> and, um, or is this the, uh, you know, performance, you know, at, you know, performance at will, and, and, and you know, when Odysseus falls asleep, you know, he, uh, he's by two olive shoots or olive uh, saplings and one's grafted and one's wild and is that a, you know sort of a metaphor for here okay we can choose which way we want to go here um, so I was just wondering what you thought of that because in sorry another thing <laughs> in um, uh, I think Professor Bouvier went to a talk uh, by him of he's from um, of France sorry I'll get the info yeah. um, he, he points to uh, three places in the song of Demonicus where he, uh -huh. uh, he, the poet pauses and at each of the beginning of those three songs he's pausing as he's, he's 
I guess theorizing, he's judging the reaction of his audience, judging the reaction of Odysseus, so he can alter his performance dynamically. So how does will and dynamic meet? <laughs> Sorry, one question. That is a um, excellent, <laughs> well-formed question that, that does get to the heart of many things we talked about last week, and it really gets to the heart of, of, of an oral performance tradition that eventually becomes textualized. Um, and, and so, yes, in terms of a plan, like as opposed to, and I think we have to maybe consider a boardroom scenario, <laughs> and mm -hmm. we have to consider a living performance scenario. Um, because you're right, the Odyssey... Uh, throughout throughout Homeric poetry, there's there are any number of ways that the poet can signal um, uh, options. You know, potential like this could have gone this way, but I'm choosing this path. In fact, there's you know there's a there's a there's a verb that actually indicates that in, in English. It usually gets translated something to the effect of there was a division in his mind as okay. to what. You. Um, someone, someone could choose path A or path B, and then there's some sort of uh, mitigation of those paths, and the poet moves on. Um, so I think the poet, any oral poet in composing, they they do they they plan their narrative in a way, um, um, always remaining open to options, especially in relationship to the audience. Um, so if, if a tale needs to go a certain way, it can be taken a certain way. Um, and, and this raises questions, too, of just how planned is an oral performance. Right. Is, it, is it pure improvisation? And I, and I think right. most people would say, no, it's not. Um, mm -hmm. um, or is it, I mean, is it, is, it, is it a transcript? Is it something that someone has just memorized? And, is, is, and are we only just seeing vestiges of these, of these once available performance options? And I think we, we should probably consider something in between. Um, um, but, but yeah, so I think that the way I look at it is the, our Odyssey and our Iliad are their oral derived texts. And there is a, there is a, degree, there's a certain degree of unity uh, a, a fair amount of unity that that can probably mostly be explained by tradition. Tradition brings a unifying force in and of itself. But I think, um, and this is this is really, I mean, no one does this kind of work better than Greg Nagy. But um, I think that um, we also have to consider that even once textualized, even once fixed in text, that we can look for those vestiges or those moments when when a plan could have shifted. Um, um, there are some very famous variations um, uh, that that, indi that could indicate this. One of which are Cretan variations, where um, there's there's a moment in which um, Telem Telemachus could have been instead of being sent to Sparta, there's this there's this manuscript variant where he says, "We'll send him to Crete," mm -hmm. um, which has led a lot of people to to not not just for that manuscript variation, for other for other internal and external evidences. Um, um, has allowed people to say, well, what if there was a rendition of the story where Telemachus went to Crete, and maybe he met Odysseus there, and maybe he brought him back in disguise, and and you start to look at uh, you start to look at this al possible alternative scenario and compare it to some of the oddities we have in our own text, and it it can explain it can help explain some of the strange unresolved things in the text as we have it, um, um, but but there's always a challenge. We don't have access to those actual traditions, so it is. it does remain hypothetical. And I think with the Phaeacian episode, the Phaeacian episode is more compelling to me as an, as an act, as, as you say, Jackie, an, an example, an option, a performance option, where the poet could have, um, depending on the audience, uh, chosen an outcome. And, and this is where I think um, uh, Professor Naj's work, uh, Jim Marks's work, um, and even Douglas Frame's work can be considered um, because now we're asking questions of performance arena and performance environment. Um, what if a poet were performing not just the whole, not the whole poem, but just this episode to an audience who considered themselves to be ancestors of the Phaeacians? Um, wouldn't they rather not hear about their own destruction? <laughs> um, so maybe this is a vest. Maybe this is something captured in the manuscript tradition that was a, a real alternative because of cultural or political um, um, considerations. Um, and I think that in in terms of a short localized performance, that is that's a fair option. Um, mm -hmm. 
alternatively, and something that I'm exploring is, what if conversely we consider the Odyssey as a whole piece that is specifically related to this other whole piece that we have, the Iliad? And that's why I'm trying to think about the, uh, the, the Achaean Wall and other, other moments of suspense and delay and see if those can all add up into, into a sensible whole, if you will. Um, and and from, a, from that viewpoint, I think it does suddenly become sensible that the Phaeacians are actually destroyed in a similar way that the, that the, that the Achaean Wall is destroyed. So... Um, I'm not answering the question on purpose <laughs> because mm-hmm. I think I think it's true in both cases, and I think we have to ask um, when and where and how was this performed. And I think only if we can answer those questions can we come up with suitable answers for which plan was being enacted or not. Um, and 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 based on those um, parameters, this variant is truly um, a question mark. I think. And, and the poet has left us so many other question marks that it, it's right. quite appropriate. Beautiful. Thank you. That's, now I need a drink. My head's <laughs> <laughs> Janet, Janet well, please. Hi. Can you introduce uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Janet Osalak from New York, originally from Istanbul, Turkey. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. Uh, I'm going to follow um, Jackie's question about the will of the poet. Uh, in uh, I believe in book eight, line forty nine, four ninety nine, uh, Demodocus is going to sing, and he's he made the song visible. Mm. He's hearing the song from the muses, and he's making it visible. And the there is uh, there is a conce- uh, the will of poet is concealed because uh, he's getting it from the muses. He is not. Uh, he's a vessel in the song visible to the will of a poet is is uh, kind of answer that question it, it, uh, can we see as a source of multi textuality and um, are we putting too much weight on the uh, Willow Pot, if we say, you know, he can change it. And how, how, how does it, still um, with the tradition, um, then the tradition is more the person, the poet's tradition, not the tradition as a whole. How do we see it? Uh, we're getting really right to the heart of these big questions, Justin. Thank you. <laughs> we're really going towards what oral poetics is about here, right? Is it? <laughs> yeah. Not to put you on the spot to answer all these questions. <laughs> these are easy questions. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I'll, um, let me just get my notepad out here and look at my prepared response. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, and so and Janet, I think I I I missed the audio was a little garbled through the middle of that, but I I think I I think I understand what you're saying. Um, and so let me reframe the question. You can tell me if 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 this is what I'm being asked to so delicately talk about. Um, are, are we are we giving if tradition if tradition has so much weight? If tradition informed by the muses, this long-standing tradition, then are we giving a single poet too much, too much authority to make changes? Is that is that kind of what, where you're going with that? Uh, y- yes, and uh, is is it the source of uh, multitextuality? Is the okay? Is it a source of multitextuality? Oh, so uh, is the will of the poet a source of multitextuality? Yes. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Um. We, we, yeah, I think yes. Uh, <laughs> I will say yes to that. Um, I think that. Um, oh boy, yeah, this is tough. Um, and what I wonder too is, I'm going to be, begin this with with a question as well. Is I, I I really do wonder if to what degree the tradition itself, and I think with the Odyssey we really have to consider this, um, given the, the 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 texture of the entire poem. Um, is there something about the Odyssey tradition itself that that encodes this kind of um, rough surface, if you will? Um, these 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 moments that allow um, any performer really to 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 zig and to zag. Um, something about it that makes it 
feel already more like um, like a multiform text. And I think, I mean, I think the the very multiformity of tradition itself is is inherent to both the Iliad and the Odyssey and the in the entire um, you know archaic Greek tradition. Um, but but I think we have to yeah is, is can a poet um, just how much can a poet work within that and change it within itself? So I think I think a talented poet um, is able to leverage what's already there, the, the multiformity that's already there, and assemble things in a manner. I think the assemblage is what's unique. It's not necessarily the 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 wrenching of the story one direction or another. Um, uh, where where a poet exerts his or her will, um, because that's already that's built in. The multiformity is there. The poet doesn't have to do that. Um, and so we're looking for we're looking for navigation, maybe. So maybe that's maybe if the poet does have power, um, it's not over the tradition or even the, for lack of a better term, I'm putting in giant scare quotes here, text <laughs> itself. Um, but they do have control over the arrangement and the alignment and juxtaposition of episodes. Um, and so the poet the poet does have access culturally and mentally to the the plan, so to speak, the the whole tradition, with well, the same thing that the muses have access to. And what the poet is showing us then, the poet's not showing us necessarily anything new because presumably a traditional audience would have access to that as well. The poet is making manifest, though, a new arrangement and and is taking the audience for a ride in that way. So, um, so I don't know. There's there's a kind of there's a there's A B and then I'm providing C, <laughs> which is yes, none of the above, and uh, and maybe the audience answers that question for us. Um, is that is that a suitable response to that, or um, what questions does that again bring up? And and I defer to anybody else here to to take that very difficult question on. <laughs> Justin, uh, hi, I'm Jack Vaughn uh, in Houston. Uh, I love what the way you uh, carefully distinguish the poetic level and the metapoetic level, where you you have things happening within the. Uh, Framework of, of of the of the epics and and then you have another level of um, of uh, the poets empowerment the poets um, um, working back on the subject of his uh, of his epics and uh, bringing it forward into the into the audience and and I, and I love what how you're discussing the the, the poet's power but my, uh, I would like your your view on uh, how the the uh, the poem, the poems, uh, the Odyssey and other epic poems empower the audience to use their imaginations to uh, see multiple scenarios. Mm -hmm. uh, I was thinking about the the instance of the ex halos of uh, Odysseus's death. Yeah. Uh, is not a. I mean, the text is the same, no matter. Uh, I mean, you know, all the texts say ex halos, but does it mean uh, out of the sea, uh, or does it mean away from the sea? Mm -hmm. And you and there are, and traditions have grown up around both uh, interpretations of the same two words. Mm -hmm. So, so Jack, you're referring to the uh, a, tr a poetic tradition that Odysseus's death will come. Exhalos, right, from the sea, so yeah. that's important. And uh, Justin, before you respond to this beautiful question from Jack, I just want to point out that Effie, I think, is also interested in responding maybe to the previous <laughs> question. Sorry, so so maybe we could just sort of work the conversation together, okay? Yeah, yeah uh, Effie, uh, Effie, stay. Save me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I won't. So I'm, I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to divert from Jack's beautiful question. Okay, I just wanted no, to acknowledge no, it. No, please let Justin uh, answer the last question because my uh, remarks were generally about the whole issues raised by the beautiful questions of Jackies and Janet. So okay. I have a lot of things to say, or perhaps just one or two. But please, uh, uh, Justin. Go ahead and answer this question, the last one, and then I'll I'll say a few things about the whole thing. Yeah. 
Sure. Yeah, and I think yeah. So as to you know how much how much is the audience um, having an effect on the poem, and and how do these um, yeah, what might the audience already be expecting and and be privy to that that the poet maybe yeah the poet doesn't have control over this right the poet the poet has to respond to the and I think the Odyssey um, is constantly doing this and that's a great example of of giving this little hint at Odysseus's death at some point later exhalos out of the sea from the sea um, and again we're we're not quite a privileged audience in that case because we're we're not sure and it and um, it allows the scholarly audience to generate their own multiformity, if you will. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and uh, just, yes, Justin, can I just say here that, uh, in terms of um, the audience reaction, we enter another huge issue, which is common to all poetics mm -hmm. and all, if you like, pieces of art, which is the audience reception. This is another thing. Since you are you are coming from a tradition and you know multiple versions. Of it, it's your own thing. What you do with the hints that the pot let you have, okay? So the ex alos can work in any in any way in terms of your own reception. And this is another huge, if you like, a uh, new domain of our our, uh, our um, uh, studies, okay? The cultural studies and the humanistic studies, which is now which places the focus of the audience but this is a, a, another thing if you like so in, in terms of the audience reception you may have you may think whatever you like once you're brought of course brought up in a certain tradition and you know both versions or three versions of the story so you may think of the three versions together you may play the poet plays with all that that's a bit of the power that the poet has because it refers to a, a known tradition and the reception could be different. And one version is not really, is not necessarily antagonistic with the other version. I'm not saying that they both coexist if they, the one uh, implies that Odysseus dies and the other implies that Odysseus does not mm -hmm. die. But in, in the mind of the audience and because there is this thing, reception, I receive it in a different way than perhaps my co-spectator, uh, okay, receives it, then you can have both. Yeah. And we are not, you know, we are not obliged to take one thread. We may take, you know, several uh, threads and, and, yeah, and uh, is... be happy with both or with all that. Yeah. yeah. And, and that, I think that that is so important to consider. Mm -hmm. Um, the difference between competing versions and a real multiformity, a, a real resonant multiformity where multiple outcomes and multiple possibilities, even possibilities that are imagined, coexist. And, and that is where the, that's where the poet, um, I think, demonstrates his or her real abilities, is, is just how successfully can all of those layers of resonance and meaning be be brought to the surface? Um, as as Janet said, can, how can it be made manifest? Um, and I think that's what the audience and the poet are both looking for. Um, and so in tales, um, I, um, so Jack, on on this question of of forecasting Odysseus's death, um, I think I think that's one one such example and and I've not and, and that one that that's laying in a footnote in a paper of mine right now so I need to <laughs> I uh, that's it's on my radar and I, I need I need to do, and 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 uh, there's there's some exemplars in folklore of that of that exact instance as well that, that might uh, enlighten the question but I wanna I wanna I wanna try to answer your question by means of another example um, and uh, Lillian Doherty um, has has done some work suggesting, and I think that um, I think she's I think she's onto something with the way the the role that Arete plays in possibly bringing the curse down upon the Phaeacians, um, and within that entire episode, and again we have this this the, the zig or zag, so to speak, that, that things seem to be able to go either way. Um, they're either destroyed or they're not. And I think the implication is fairly clear that if Odysseus is sent home, 
uh, we expect that Poseidon's going to be angry and actually fulfill this curse. Um, because Alkenos introduces it in, in vague terms, both saying it may or may not happen in a certain way, but also he never names a specific hero. Um, and then we're led to expect that Ariete is going to actually be the operative agent in this hero's return, and then she, she acts in a manner, she responds positively to him. And so the audience, I think, is being um, nudged by the poet to say, oh my gosh, it's happening. Uh, he's going to make it home, and these people are going to be destroyed. And, and when the episode is left wide open, um, we are, we're left with this open space um, that the audience would, is left to consider which, do we want to do this? Like, do we want to, do we want to help this guy um, at our own expense, and what does that mean? Um, and I think that um, that raises questions as to how ancient audiences would have interfaced with, with hero cult um, and, and um, offered sacrifices within that framework. And, and so I think that sometimes these moments of indeterminacy and opening are hints at alternative outcomes um, are left at a pause specifically to bring the audience into the question. Um, and, and the audience is left to ask themselves, how do we want to affect this story as well? What, which version do we want to hear? Um, and, and does choosing a version out of multiformity have consequences for us? And I think that metapoetically it does have consequences because in choosing one path, it necessarily shuts down others. They're always there. They're always in tradition available to resonate with diction and type scenes and phraseology and all that good stuff. But um, choices actually are made, and it prevents, certain choices prevent other outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so there is, I don't know, it's almost maybe lamentable. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, we, okay, we want to see what happens. Let's send him home in this manner uh, and, and, We'll, we'll take the hit, <laughs> we'll be destroyed, but we really want this guy to get home because we want to hear the way you're going to tell how Ithaca unfolds because we're, we're interested. What you say about Arete in, 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 your, in your paper and today uh, has uh, really uh, sparked a whole new reading in my mind uh, of the Odyssey. Uh, and and it, it sort of uh, dovetails with a, a book I'm reading by Bettany Hughes about Helen of Troy. Um, uh, she she uh, goes into the, uh, the Mycenaean background such as we know it from uh, Linear B where, you know, we're still uh, learning a little bit more uh, year by year since uh, Ventress and Chadwick uh, about uh, how matriarchal uh, the Mycenaean uh, civilization was, and uh, you know how how the the uh, the power uh, comes to the men by, by through the women. So if you didn't uh, have Helen, uh, my, uh, Menelaus would not have been the you know the great. Uh, potentate that, that, that he was. And, and with the Phaeacians, you, you point out yourself, you know, uh, Odysseus is led to, to go right directly to Arete. Uh, you know, Alkinoos is, 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 um, is there and he's important, but uh, I'll, I need to uh, turn it back to you because you, you're really the uh, the expert here. Well, I, see, <laughs> I see Janet's hand is up as well. Yeah. Oh, can, can we also talk about Arete's lineage when in your answer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, so Alkenos and Arete are um, related um, and married, and they both they they so. When, the, when Athena introduces Arete in Book 7, um, she does it by way of a genealogy, which I find to be pretty fascinating. Um, and the genealogy goes back to Poseidon. Um, and 
and now Sithuus is part of the genealogy as well. And if if you and and Rexenor is mentioned, um, these these very these very um, these powerful figures who all have a very specific um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They they all have a stake in Phaeacian culture to to a degree. Um, and in, in in introducing Arete as well, not, uh, linking her to these to these particular men, um, we also learn about we we start to put together these pieces that the poet poet has given us is that there's this connection to the uh, Kiklopes and the Gigantes and and they're possibly related to some of these kind of monstrous people um, and all of the the, the catalog m resonate it makes resonant. A series of associations, so that by the time we get to Arete's identity in the catalog, I think she is encoded with a set of associations. Um, but I think Poseidon, in particular, is 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 the most important character in that in that genealogy. Um, and um, as to as to her power, um, there are there are many who have who have tried to. Look at her from a um, from the standpoint of uh, matriarchal society, um, because she is given a fair amount of power um, by the poet, or at least it, she she resolves disputes among men. Um, she you know the the king is explicitly bypassed. Um, she she seems to have a lot of power, and Athena introduces her as such. So so there there are uh, there's no sort shortage of theories about um, Arete's. Um, I guess kind of holdover uh, role, or she comes from maybe an older older tradition um, that demonstrates some kind of matriarchal power. Um, but she she's been very problematic in Homeric scholarship because despite despite all of these um, resonant encoded um, images of high importance to the queen, after she asks Odysseus about the clothing, she and I think it's just seeming. I, I believe that she really does affect the outcome of the tale, um, but she seemingly disappears from that point. Um, and also of note, if we're speaking of genealogies and Arete's genealogical introduction, that's a it's a good place to it's a good moment to compare to the genealogy of the catalog of heroines. And there are other women in that catalog who have genealogical ties or special relationships. Um, with Poseidon as well. And so I think um, genealogies across the board in the Odyssey, um, they resonate with one another and, and can be used as kind of keys of interpretation. Um, um, but yeah, I could, I could go on and on about this queen. <laughs> um, but um, uh, yeah, I think that I think the, her genealogy, in addition to other diction, points to her as somebody that you want to keep your eyes on. Um, and she might even have the ability to overcome Poseidon's will in this in this narrative, but maybe at great expense. Yeah. I, I I don't don't want to uh, go ahead. Yeah. Welcome, yeah. but could I uh, ask you? Uh, and, and this is uh, uh, probably a question for both our visiting scholars. Uh, how how do you see the um, the idea in the Cypria about the will of Zeus for the destruction of the the race of heroes uh, playing out in in this narrative? Okay, that's another question. Is <laughs> I'm 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 trying to you know as as the discussion you know develops I I. Just have the feeling of you know, jump in and and start uh, saying things, and then please, we please. so quickly to another question, which is a huge question and another issue that I don't know what to do now. <laughs> That's okay. So you know, we have eight minutes until twelve, uh, depending I, on on the time that people eight have. Eight minutes. I don't think I'll manage to do anything actually. I'll just need to uh, to to add. Uh, one detail uh, about Arete's uh, genealogy, which I'm not sure which is, uh, whether it is right or, 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 or wrong, but it struck me the other day when I was preparing the uh, material for uh, last, uh, last week's uh, 
a presentation and I was checking the passages that uh, uh, Justin had sent and I realized, and I don't know whether Justin agrees with that or not, that arete is a type of epicleros core, core which in a Athenian legislation, but classical legislation, okay, is the niece, okay, is the woman in a family that her father dies without male descendants and she needs to marry, no matter what, her closest male relative. Yeah. So Arete is the niece of Alkinos. And I think it's rather explicit somewhere, that's why it struck, it struck me and I said, but this is an epicleros core, is that uh, her father uh, does not have any male descendants and she has to marry no matter what uh, uh, Alkinos, okay? So, if this is the case, perhaps part of her power comes from the fact that she's actually entitled to her father's um, money, if I may say so, you know, all the, uh, um, uh, and the idea behind this le legislation is that the money and everything, you know, estates and all that, do not go to another family, but stays within the family. Because inheritance in ancient Greece goes through or uh, via the male descendants, not the female descendants, okay? So women cannot inherit in Athens, only in Sparta they uh, can inherit money or estate and all that. So in, in this reading, which was, of course, I'm not sure whether you have uh, come across uh, uh, this idea about Arete before, but it struck me like she actually is the, the woman who inherits her father, and perhaps part of her, her power comes from there. What do you think, Justin? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I, um, I, I just recently read some similar items on, um, and I, I'm, the reference is not coming to mind. But um, Arete was not specifically referenced, yeah. but I thought this, this is her, you know. Um, and um, yeah, yeah. And it immediately makes me think about not not being a specialist in Athenian law. It it immediately makes me think about. Um, the way she resonates with Penelope and the situation going on in Ithaca and the dispute, the dispute over property um, and inheritance and and the and the the, ju the manner in which the suitors are going to have to resolve what's eventually going to be a yeah, legal that's, issue. that's another huge problem. We never actually understand what what's going on there. Yeah. What is the status of Penelope exactly? Yeah. Whether they would inherit the suitors or whoever marries her, whether he would inherit the kingdom or the whatever, or nothing of all that. Mm -hmm. We don't. It's it's such a, such a big yeah. problem there. But Arete's power, on the other hand, perplexes me very much because, as very wisely said, very rightly said, she disappears completely in such a way that one has the feeling that this is a very, a very, um, not really a power which is well embedded. I'm not sure whether it is not embedded in the narrative or the customs or in the tradition, but it seems that uh, the poet uses the whole device or perhaps he uses uh, uh, something which was traditional, but then he doesn't need it anymore, and he dis she disappears, like actually as um, na uh, um, uh, Navsika, another another, if you like, important or interesting parallel to uh, Arete is her own daughter, mm -hmm. who actually saves Odysseus, does the whole thing you know, um, uh, engineers actually how he will go back, uh, gives him, gives him, you know, clothing and food and everything, gives him advice as to how to behave in a city, okay, not to expose her, not to be very uh, careless, um, going through a place where perhaps there is hostility against him. She sounds as a very wise old man in a sense. <laughs> and as soon as everything goes smoothly and she's sort of handing auditions to her mother, she disappears as well.
Yeah. So we may have a parallel there of two females, mm -hmm. which seemingly who seemingly have power, but we don't really know whether they have power. Again, we fall back into a patriarchal society where actually men have the power. This is my feeling, and I don't think that we can ever solve this problem. I don't know whether you have solved it, but yeah. I don't know. I'm, I'm trying very hard to solve it. <laughs> yeah. but, but can, can we be a bit relaxed and uh, admit that some things cannot be solved? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, and it's it's one of the it's it's exciting because every every time I think I get something in my grasp, it it kind of like her, it, it goes away. Um, yeah. And yeah. Um, and I do. Uh, now Sika is such. Uh, such an interesting character, especially from the standpoint of multiformity as well, because um, many people have remarked that um, you know Odysseus, outside of the Odyssey, Odysseus is pretty well known in tradition for for having children elsewhere on different yeah. islands. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Becomes metonymic for this possibility that maybe maybe Odysseus is going to get stuck on this island. Um, yeah, this, yeah, very, this endogamous yeah. island where where yeah. where yeah. property stays yeah. Uh, yeah, and yeah. Um, and 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 I think the way the Odyssey handles uh, it, it, the the poet handles this situation um, pretty pretty with clarity and quickly um, that okay you're not gonna marry me you're gonna go to my mom <laughs> and, <then Yeah>. Odysseus, <laughs> and and Arete's question about the clothing um, yeah. just brings this into sh such sharp focus because it, yeah. it Unlike the other times he's questioned in this formulaic way, and he tells a lying tale, she asks him the traditional question, and then instead of ending it with the traditional second half of the line um, where he questions about his parents and his city, she says, and where did you get those clothes? Yes, she yes, yes. Anchors yes. Odysseus. She, it's a control question. I think Elizabeth Minchin calls it a control question, and I think it's because it, it anchors him into a, phys a physical object that is already interpreted for us in the epic. Odysseus can't really weasel his way out of this one. Um, and Odysseus is certain to tell Alcanoas and Arete that, that, um, that Nausicaa has acted honorably. And in this whole, it's as if this whole question of potential um, endogamous marriage is, is dodged by way of Nausicaa. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, that's, and she's such an animatic character, and Arete is too, and I think that's one, yeah. Yeah. one of the... Yeah. Phil. But I, I don't think it's limited to that because the uh, what I'm finding is that the 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 there is an alignment of diction surrounding the queen that in her limited appearances the the language is so resonant that it seems to be it seems to be indicating at least her use as a poetic tool or a navigational marker yeah. in the epic. Um, but at the same time, um, and I've spoken with Lillian Doherty about this, and she was very sure to say. And, I, and she's right, is that in the end, um, it, it, men at the face of it retain the, the patriarchal power, you know, so it's, yeah, it is yeah, this, this is definitely true in, in the Odyssey and in yeah. the Iliad, Def, definitely. Yeah, I, I know I don't have time at all, and it's all, already one minute past seven, but okay. uh, Claudia, do I have sort of five minutes or not? Oh my gosh, yes, I mean, so long as, well, let's just let other people know if they, for some reason, yes. You know, if they're joining us from work and they have to leave, that's yes. fine. Um, but, yeah, Helen needs to go. That's fine, Helen. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your presence. Um, oh. And, you know, we do have some viewers who are joining us online, so um, maybe we can, uh, you know, invite them if they want to to submit a question um, I, in the last few minutes, okay? This is Jackie. I did have a comment on what Fima and Justin were just talking about. I was wondering uh, if, if um, because you were making the the note that Nostica, I'm not sure I pronounce things correctly. Pardon me. She disappears when it goes to Rete, but and I know Douglas Frame has, has talked about this. Um, but what if you extend that line when Arete disappears? It really that it transfers to Penelope, all three as the embodiment of Athena Pallas because the way Penelope is physically set up, 
when she meets Odysseus, it's as if she is to be adored and um, as a goddess, you know, next to the hearth, next to the hearth light, against the wall, near a bearing post. Could it be that it really they're not disappearing, but they're transforming? Mm -hmm. That whole yeah. reason. I I I have very my I've had that thought myself because I my my initial excitement on on digging into this problem with Arete was, um, um, and, and with Penelope too, as we, um, in the traditional read turn tale, all eyes are on the wife. And, and that, from a narrative viewpoint, that gives the wife a lot of power. And that's an exciting mm -hmm. reading, is, is, is to lend these women a, an authority over the tale, you know. Um, so, um, Arete, I think, I, th I think that's a good way to think about it, is that where her power ends, it, it, it continues in a multi-form kind of character, if you will, right. onto Penelope. Um, and, and then you have to start looking at, at people like Circe as well. And mm -hmm. she, she seemingly plays, she plays a similar role in forwarding Odysseus, at least throughout the major stops of his, his Nostos. And then, you know, that raises questions about Calypso as well. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, Bruce Loudon has done some structural work on this, and he, he puts Circe, um, Arete slash Nausicaa, <laughs> and Penelope within this structural pattern that you're talking about. So, so yeah, I think that's, that's an interesting way to look at it, and that's something I'm considering myself, is, is does, does Penelope simply pick up where Arete left off? And, yeah. and Douglas Frame um, adds the dimension of, adds the Athena's controlling dimension in this as well. Um, and I, I, I think that an audience would certainly, I think that would resonate, that, that Athena's role in the epic does in fact resonate with Arete and Penelope's role. Um, mm -hmm. And my only hesitation there is to, is, is I, I like to see Arete and Penelope as humans. Um, yeah. And so That's I, my, yeah. 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 And so That's if they become... <laughs> yeah. There is this real, there's this tremendous human element in yeah. the destruction and loss and reintegration into the household. Uh, I think for that to really shine, I, I think we have to allow uh, a, uh, a resonance with Athena, but I'm not, sh yeah. I'm not sure the, a full substitution makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. So and to, uh, and to also, uh, sorry, Claudia. No, I was just going to say, Epi, please go. We wanted to hear oh, you. Okay. If you, if you, uh, it's a very interesting thought actually that uh, females do not disappear, but they get into a sort of transformation into uh, the next female who takes over. But in this sense, also we actually eliminate also the uh, um, the autonomous character of all these uh, female um, uh, beings, in a sense of female creatures, because all of them have their own characteristics and they act and react in a way which is proper to them. Mm -hmm. Especially you cannot just actually say that Penelope is the um, uh, everything builds up to sort of uh, um, uh, create Penelope because Penelope is always there even if she's not in the action, we have her in our mind all the time with specific characteristics with uh, um, uh, um, uh, sadness and longing for Odysseus and Penelope also is in the mind of Odysseus all the time as well so we cannot really, this is to my mind a bit, uh, how would I say, that it destroys actually the beauty of all the different personalities that uh, the poet actually builds up so I would hesitate, not that it's not interesting, but uh, I wouldn't buy it personally, if you like. So I would <laughs> let them be individuals, and of course they share common characteristics, because there is a typology of female characteristics as well, isn't it? But apart from that, I think they have their own uh, standing, so uh, I should sort of go for that. And if, if I just say uh, my 
you know, my, my remark uh, about something which uh, uh, Janet and Jackie uh, at the beginning of our uh, conversation raised and I think this is a very interesting question and of course Justin has already given beautiful several answers, <laughs> okay, uh, eloquent answers. I would like just to stress um, something about our problem or our issue, how much authority does the poet have in a traditional or oral uh, tradition. Now, to my mind, perhaps because I'm getting old and I'm getting more relaxed about things, <laughs> Uh, I don't think there is a, a, an antagonism there. And I will just bring you as an example something which is very obvious to all, all of us, but sometimes we forget it. Okay. Take the Iliad, for example, the whole of the Iliad, okay? the plan of the Iliad. And I liked uh, what um, uh, Janet said, that when we have, we, she hears about plan, uh, she, she thinks of bullet points, of a, a very rigid and unflexible framework. Now, first of all, this is not our idea of a plan when we talk about the Iliad and the Odyssey. We talk about something quite uh, flexible and something which is a framework but not rigid at all. So somebody can play with that, okay? Now, the second thing that I would like to um, uh, make you think about is think of the Iliad and the structure of the Iliad per se. Now, uh, Martin West said something very interesting in the making of the Iliad some years ago when he published this book, that the anger of Achilles could be could have been on Homer's own invasion, okay? It's an innovation of Homer. We don't know whether Achilles was really angry in any other of the six cyclic poems, okay? So perhaps Homer himself uh, invented or thought of the anger of the hero. And he built all his narrative around this single incident. And we know how intricate is this structure, okay? We know that it's only 52 days, only 52 days, okay? Only four days of battle. And we hear about the before and after through various techniques that Homer uses, like you have the duel between Paris and uh, um, Menelaus in the second, I think, book, which was out of place. After 10 years of war, they thought about quarreling or um, have a duel between them, the two lovers or the two husbands. It took them 10 years to realize that there are the, you know, the rivals for Helen. It's, it's a device for us to see the beginning of the war. And the same uh, applies to the catalog of the ships, okay? And the same applies to the Tichoscopia when uh, Helen walks on the walls of Troy to say, oh, this guy is Agamemnon and this guy is Menelaus. Of course everybody knew, 10 years were there. Okay, so there are devices for Homer to build up his narrative as he, is, he wanted. So, my uh, point is that Homer comes from a tradition and all the audience knew about Agamemnon and Menelaus and the outcome of, of the war, but they didn't know this version of the story. And this version of the story is Homer's doing. He did it. He devised it. He thought of it. And to my mind, and some, this is something which I very often say, probably it survived because it was the best version of the story, okay? It's, it was the best selling of the time, okay? But this is a authority, huge authority that the poet has. Not just how he plays with the uh, internal plan of, uh, of uh, Zeus and the second plan of Achilles and then what I named or I called in our last presentation the plan of the poet. But think of how he structured the whole thing. It's a unique thing, a unique, a unique piece of art, of poetry, and it is his own doing. It, this is not part of the tradition, this is Homer. Okay, this is my last, uh, you know, thoughts that I wanted to share with you. And honestly, I can say that for the Odyssey as well. The Odyssey is even more complicated than the Iliad. 
it's indeed it's more complicated because you have three narratological threads. Okay, one stra starts from Ithaca, the other is the um, island of um, um, of Calypso. Okay, when you have Odysseus, you have also a little short thing, but again, it's quite important when uh, Telemachus is set out to find his father, and you have to bring all that together, and they somehow they have to meet and to. Um, um, sort of advance the whole thing in order to have Odysseus back home and have all the uh, people who would help him to solve not just the homecoming as very very uh, nicely Justin said but also the recognition which is the end of the Odyssey because the Odyssey ends with the recognition and the um, of course the punishment of, of the shooters and then the a harmony or the um, uh, smoothing out of all the conflict that it was really uh, part of the uh, way that the Odyssey was structured. So let me tell you that my, my, my firm belief is that you have a single poet behind each of these poems. Of course he builds within a tradition. <coughs> And that's even even more interesting because he expects his audience to know a lot of things and he plays with all the versions and all the multiformity and all that. But then this this specific version which is survived, okay, it's his own doing. This is my uh my my my, my firm belief as, as I said. I don't know whether you I I helped it at all in the discussion, but so Effie, you know, actually, I think it's really important that we're getting different viewpoints about these issues, right? Um, we're hearing multiform perspectives on the authority of the poet, the the way that tradition and a poet could interact. Um, you know, it's all part of our dialogue, and uh, you know, we're so so grateful. Um, Justin, do you have any last words? Uh, you know, it is twelve fourteen. We're we're a little bit over, so we should probably sign off. Sure. sure. No, I think I think uh, Effie's remarks just now are a really nice closing. Closing um, because, uh, um, yeah, I think it it um, yeah, there is a there is a kind of poetic authority and power um, in 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 the arrangement. And um, just I just one thing, one minor thing I would add, which uh, just complements what Effie just said, is that um, I think in thinking about what the poet is up to and the plan of the poet. Um, it's nice to think about part for whole and and the the whole tradition is looming you know for poet and audience and the poet has to pull pieces and parts of it together um, to, to make um, a, a momentary uh, temporary piece of art um, that only really comes to life when it resonates with that tradition that's held both by the poet and the audience. So it becomes, um, and I use that word a lot, but it just it just really gets I think to the heart of Homeric poetry is resonance. It, it's a it's a relationship between um, people, and it's an artistic relationship, and um, and 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 all these all these tiny little threads and. And uh, things from single words up to the whole story pattern are are um, are these beautifully wrought uh, vestiges that that come to life between poet and audience. I think it's just a, a really nice way to to leave things. Wow, wow, you guys, this is just such an amazing and helpful talk. We're so appreciative that you could join us today, and I hope we will continue the conversation on the hour twenty five uh, discussion forum on the hour twenty five website. Um, and you know we'll be looking forward to reading both of your works uh, in the coming months and years to come. Uh, and especially Effie, uh, I know we didn't get a chance to talk about the Cooklos project today. We did talk about it last time. Um, yes. And that's a yes. very important project. Yes. So I would refer people to our last discussion, and then also uh, hopefully we can have more discussion with Cooklos scholars. Um, Thank you. And, Thank and you so much. So it's always a pleasure to be with you. You too. I look forward to seeing you very soon. So thank, thank you. you everybody for joining us. Sorry we ran over. Um, but I think it was very, very worthwhile, those extra 50 minutes. And we'll, uh, we'll see you hopefully in another week. Take care. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye.